Simple Explanation of Work Ideas by Maurice Nicole Chapter 7 Unless we see what factor in ourselves stands in our way, we cannot grow, cannot undergo an inner development. If we wish to develop, we have to be able to observe ourselves. It is usual to see all our difficulties as being due to causes outside ourselves, because this is all we do see. But if we begin to realize that it is ourselves, our level of being, that attracts our life, and understand the necessity of working on ourselves because our problem lies in ourselves, we can begin to change. If we can come to the point of realizing that our problems lie in ourselves, we know that everything depends on our efforts to change ourselves. And unless we come to this point of consciousness, everything will remain not merely the same, but will get worse. We must try to discover by self-observation what it is that keeps us in the same place in ourselves. To change life means to change ourselves. But mostly we have the illusion that change for the improvement of our life depends on outer circumstances, and that those ought to be different. This is what makes us unhappy. The first thing we have to do to change ourselves is to give up our suffering. But people will not. They struggle to keep it. The work says that the world is governed not by sex or power, but by negative emotions. That is, by certain states of the emotional center called negative emotions. This refers to suffering. Unless we give up suffering, we cannot change. The first sign of wrong attitude to life, the first illusion, is useless suffering. This happens because we approach life through our own ideas of what it ought to be, and imagine that what happens to us is exceptional. All this produces suffering because we have not understood the nature of life and don't wish to know. We struggle with difficulties, yes, but think of our lives as spoiled. We therefore come to a new standpoint, that of realizing our lives are spoiled by suffering and wishing to be rid of all useless self-pity and the sense of grievance and despondency. We have to feel that life owes us nothing, and other people owe us nothing. On the contrary, we have to feel that we owe to others and owe to life more than we can repay. In the words of the Lord's Prayer, properly translated, we should ask for our debts to be cancelled as we cancel the debts owed to us. Not forgive. As we eliminate from ourselves the idea that we are owed something by others, so do we become free. The feeling of being owed is useless suffering. When we struggle with this, we are suffering usefully. This effort needs work ideas. Life ideas encourage useless suffering and in the end deprive us of pleasure, happiness, and new interests. To change oneself, one must be free from petty attachments and from forms of imagination about oneself that hold us in the position we are in in life. We are attached to everything in ourselves. Vanity, stupidity, merit, beauty, elegance, accomplishments, self-evaluation, etc. And particularly to suffering. These must be weakened for a change to take place. Or it may be that we are attached to the other side of the same coin, to the idea of not being ambitious, of not bothering about life. The centers. Intellectual center is born with a negative part and a positive part, as in order to think there must be a comparison, an ability to say yes and no. The emotional center is not born with a negative part. It should not be there, but it is acquired by the influence of people who are negative. By contact with adults, a child learns to pity itself, to feel grievances, to speak crossly, to dwell on its misfortunes, to be melancholy, moody, irritable, suspicious, jealous, to hurt others, etc. This dreadful infection of a child is something against which nothing can be done because it is not clearly recognized. This infection forms the negative part in emotional center, and this infection is handed on from generation to generation. Negative emotions may take very subtle forms, but eventually they all lead down to violence, 
Once negative emotion passes beyond a certain point, it rouses deep-seated factors in the instinctive center, and people then want to hurt and murder one another. There is a particular reason why negative emotions are even worse than this. We have two higher centers in us, higher intellectual and higher emotional, that are fully developed and working, but we are not in contact with them. When we feel a lack in ourselves, an emptiness, a sense of futility and of being lost in a world we do not understand, it is due to the fact that we cannot hear higher centers. But if we made contact with higher centers in our ordinary state, our lower centers would be rendered a thousand times worse, more intense. We can live in a better world, in this world, if negative emotions are reduced to a minimum. If, after having observed our negative emotions, we struggle with our emotional life, we shall see that our whole attitude to life needs changing. It is impossible to overcome negative emotions alone, because they are involved in our whole attitude to life. Every situation needs a new standpoint by which to think of it. Our whole idea of ourselves has to be changed, and this is work on oneself. The work is designed to put us in touch with higher centers. But while we are governed by negative emotions, the influences coming from higher centers cannot reach us. Chapter 8 From the standpoint of this teaching, man is not one, he is not a unity. From the point of view of centers, he is three, an intellectual man, an emotional man, and an instinctive moving man. The work also speaks of man in terms of knowledge and being. These two sides form him. He is both, not merely his knowledge, nor merely his being. First, consider being. Different kinds of animals have different being. The being of a snake is different from that of a grasshopper, and the being of a grasshopper from that of a pig, and a pig has different being from the being of a tiger. A carpenter selects his wood according to its suitability for a job. If some stock of wood has not matured rightly, he will say something to the effect that its nature has gone out of it. He is talking about being. It is not difficult to realize that people have different kinds of knowledge, but it is not easy to realize that they have different kinds of being. The conception of being is emphasized in the work, and we must try to realize what being is, and why the concept is so stressed. First example. A man of superior knowledge in his field, but who does all kinds of mean and petty acts, is full of envy, cheats, steals information without acknowledging it. Although this is obvious to us, he does not realize it and is astonished that people do not like him. Without understanding that this man has two sides, knowledge and being, we shall be baffled by him. We dislike his being, and we can describe his level of being as such and such. Second example. A man has no particular knowledge, but is not malicious, is not mean and petty, does not cheat, keeps his word. Although in knowledge he is undeveloped, his level of being is higher than the first man's. If we value only knowledge, we shall admire the first man, whatever he does, because of his knowledge, and despise the second because he is ignorant. This judgment will define us, because we shall then have poor being, this is the tendency today, to make heroes of criminals. But a criminal cannot be taught because his level of being will always use his knowledge in a criminal way. We make use of our knowledge according to our level of being. For instance, two people with harmful knowledge of a third person. It is their level of being which determines their behavior. From this we can see that knowledge and being are different and that our relation to our knowledge is governed by our being. To give knowledge to a person of being lower than his knowledge results in its misuse. The work teaches that our knowledge and being should have equal development. If the two are approximately equal, the result is that we understand our knowledge. Understanding is defined as the resultant of knowledge and being. Knowledge by itself being by itself, neither alone gives us understanding. 
We can know a lot and understand nothing. We can develop on the side of being to a point, and yet be stupid or ignorant. In order to change, we must develop on the side of knowledge and on the side of being. If we only study the system intellectually, nothing will change. If we try to work on being without studying the knowledge, we will come to a stop. There will be no increase of understanding. When we begin to understand what we did not understand before, there is the chance of change precisely through this understanding. A man is his understanding, and he cannot develop save through his understanding. It is said that our level of being attracts our life, and that if we wish our life to be different, a change in our level of being is necessary. That means that as long as our being stays the same, the same kind of things will happen to us, no matter the place or the circumstances. We can see that knowledge and being are relative in different people. Relativity of knowledge can be understood, but relativity of being is more difficult to understand. Chapter 9 Man is regarded as unfinished, incomplete, imperfect. He has the possibility of completing himself, perfecting himself, and all that is necessary for this lies in him. He is an experiment in self-evolution. As he is mechanically, he is incomplete and undeveloped, but is capable of a further inner development. For this reason, it is said that man is a self-developing organism. In the New Testament, man is compared to a seed. It is said that unless a man dies to what he is now, he cannot evolve into what is possible for him. A definite transformation is being spoken about by which the experiment can be completed. The idea that man is a self-developing organism means that he cannot develop under compulsion. To see God in the flesh would mean man being compelled to believe by the evidence of the senses, but man cannot develop in this way at all. He can only develop through understanding. If man is a special experiment on this earth, as distinct from the animals which cannot undergo an individual evolution, what does it mean? It means that a man can only develop internally if he begins to understand the necessity of it and seeks for the means himself. It is only through internal freedom, which is one's understanding, that a man can evolve. No external compulsion can bring this about. When we see we are wrong and realize what we are like and how we behave, then from this basis self-evolution becomes possible. We begin to change when we begin to understand ourselves and see the need. Man is free to change himself through his own understanding. This is the only sense in which he is free, and this freedom no one can take from him. No one can change life or other people, but each person can change himself. This system begins with a man, with oneself, with you and his object is to change you yourself. No rules, rituals, ceremonies, or regulations, even if their aim is to develop man, can change him unless he begins to understand. The work, therefore, begins by teaching that we must try to enter into ourselves and begin to see ourselves. Prayers, pilgrimages, etc., are useless because they are taken externally, it is only through new knowledge and work on our being that new understanding can be born. The next idea is that man is in a bad situation on this earth. The earth is a small point in the solar system, the solar system a small point in the Milky Way or galaxy, and the galaxy is only one of many galaxies. Man is in a bad position under many laws which do not necessarily contribute to his well-being. Cosmically speaking, Man is a small thing in the universe, a new experiment which might be wiped out in favor of another experiment. Man becomes of consequence only when he realizes his meaning and destiny and begins to live more consciously. If man were only a machine, he would not suffer his inner painful doubts and uncertainties, simply because he would then be a machine. But everyone knows in a dim way that this is not the case and that they should be different. 
The third idea about man is that as long as he remains asleep and mechanical, he is used. If man were incapable of doing anything about himself, his position would be without hope. He would be subject to all that happens around him, floods, disease, war, etc. It would be his sole life. But if man is created a self-developing organism, life cannot fulfill him, and is not supposed to fulfill him. His full meaning is not in life. But life uses us, owing to our position on this planet. Rearrangement of outer things still leaves us under the same laws that use man. As long as being remains the same, mankind attracts the same kind of life, recurrently. The only starting point of change is in us, in our spirit. All mankind is asleep from the point of view of this system. We are asleep, and in this state mankind can do nothing. Today mankind is being used more and more by cosmic forces outside him because he has discarded the power to awaken. This system turns round the central point that man is a self-developing organism, capable of evolving through his understanding and changing his level of being, by which means he can come under new influences and reach help. In the first two states of consciousness we are mechanical and cannot change. Only at the third level of consciousness, or self-remembering, can man alter his situation on this earth.